But uh, Isaiah 35. Isaiah 35. Just a brief chapter here. And I shared this, mentioned this to you uh, last week, uh, that chapters 34 and 35 begin to turn a corner. Because the beginning of Isaiah has a lot of reference to judgment, and there is grace interspersed, but a lot of judgment. And uh, a lot of repetition sometimes. And now we're going to get to a section here very soon where there's a historical section. And then after that begins what we might think of as the section that emphasizes God's grace. It'll be interspersed with judgment, but grace is the great theme of the latter chapters of Isaiah. And so 34 and 35 are a little bit of a, a summary almost, or kind of a, again, just a turning point in the book. And uh, last week, we talked about the fact that uh, the Word of God referenced the land of Idumea, which is uh, Edom or Esau, uh, the land where the inhabitants uh, there were from, uh, they were descendants of Esau, and how God used that as a little bit of a, an example of how he would judge the nations based on what they did with others and how that is important to God. Chapter 35 continues that theme but it bounces off of the theme that 34 ended with, which was how uh, because of their failure to do what God wanted them to do in Edom, in Idumea, that their land would be uninhabited. And in verse 15 of chapter 34, that the great owl would make her last nest there and lay and hatch and gather under the shadow, and the vultures would be gathered, everyone with her mate, and that God promised that that would happen. And now chapter 35 continues that theme. Let's look at it together. I'll read out loud and you follow along. The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it, the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of of our God. We'll read the rest of it as we go along. But as I study this Isaiah 35, I would title this message, What Could Have Been and What Will Be. What Could Have Been and What Will Be, because this is a reference to the blessing that God will bring upon the earth during the millennial kingdom. And that could have been, and you'll see this as we get into it, because if the nation of Israel, if the Jewish people would have known their Messiah for what he was, what a difference it would have made. You remember Jesus, and I think we'll look at this uh, later on. Do you remember Jesus standing over Jerusalem and looking over and crying over Jerusalem and saying basically, now my own words, now not his, but if only you would have known and done what you should have done, I would have blessed you, is basically what he was saying. And I think we'll look at the exact passage a little bit later. But what could have been, but here's the beautiful thing, it will be. Man's failure to respond to God's truth does not mean that God's purposes are nullified. God will fulfill his purposes. And it might, there might be a pause, and there is, we're in the middle of that pause, there might be a change in the fact that some of the people that could have had it didn't get it, and others who weren't supposed to have it will get it. That's you and me, the Gentiles. But God's purposes will be fulfilled. Let's pray and we'll get into this message, what could have been and what will be. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for giving us an opportunity again to study your word. Lord, we thank you for your word. It is wonderful to have it in our hands. It's wonderful to have it in our language, to understand it and be able to look at it and have confidence that every word that we read is exactly what you wanted us to have in our hands. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for that wonderful truth. And now, Lord, would you help us to submit ourselves to your word, to uh, not be rebellious, not be stiff-necked or hard-hearted, but, Lord, to be humble and tender. Work on me, work on all of us in that regard. And then, Lord, feed your people tonight. They need you. I need you, and I pray that you'd help me to be faithful to the text, that I would not just go off on rabbit trails of my own making, but Lord, that I would be led by you, and that I would preach the truth, and when I stand before you, I'd be unashamed, and I pray, Lord, that you'd help with that. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Turn in your Bibles, keeping your place in Isaiah 35, turn with me to Matthew 23. Matthew 23, obviously, is toward the end of uh, Jesus' ministry uh, as far as his uh, earthly ministry and his time uh, in Israel. And uh, Matthew 23, we look at verse number 34. So Matthew 23 and verse 34. It says, where, this is Jesus speaking, he says, Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues, and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel and the blood of Zacharias, son of Berechias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation." And then verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate, for I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord." The Lord Jesus had just spent approximately three years of ministry uh, offering himself as the Messiah uh, to the Jewish nation, to the, uh, the seed of Abraham. And uh, they had rejected him. They had chosen uh, their own way, and they had chosen their idolatry and false religion over him. And uh, he is lamenting over that, and just lamenting not only over the fact that they had rejected him, but what they had missed out on God had great blessings planned for them if only they would have received their Messiah. And so that brings us back now to Isaiah 35, which is, in, uh, uh, in my opinion here, a summary of basically what the Messiah will do during the Millennial Kingdom. This is what they could have had if they would have received him. Uh, in Isaiah 35, we're going to look at verses 1 and 2, then we'll look at verses 3 and 4, then we'll look at 5 and 6, and then 7 through 9, and then we'll look at verse 10. And each of those have their own theme. Let's talk about verses 1 and 2 first of all. And we'll see there that the promise was that the earth will see the glory of the Lord. It says in Isaiah 35, The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them. And the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it. The excellency of Carmel and Sharon, they shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Verse 1 is a reference back to the previous chapter that in the area of Edom, as the owls and the satires and the different animals that would take over the land when the people are gone, as they are there, that uh, the wilderness and the solitary place would be glad for them, that in the middle of all that, God was going to take a place like the wilderness and make it a beautiful place place. The wilderness is not a beautiful place. The wilderness is not a place where you can live and uh, thrive and do well. But God would make it that way, and that was God's promise. And by the way, isn't that what God is good at? God is good at taking something that's bad and making it a blessing. That references what we talked about this morning, and the fact that God is able to take the difficult times and the wilderness times that we go through and turn them into a blessing. Well, that's what God promises to do, th do to the earth, that he would not leave Edom in the place she was, where the wilderness is barren, where nobody dwells there, where it's all done. God didn't judge man and then just leave it. Yes, God judged man, but then God would turn around and make all things beautiful in his time. The wilderness will be blessed. Now look at what verse 2 says about that wilderness. Uh, it says, by the way, in verse 1, that the desert will rejoice and blossom as the rose. But in verse 2 it says, it, the, the desert, will blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The desert will become a place where there's joy and singing. And it, it goes on to say there, the glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it. The excellency of Carmel and Sharon. What does that mean? Well, Lebanon is the place in the northern part of Israel. That was a mountainous area in the northern part of Israel. That's where the country of Lebanon gets, it, gets its name. It's north of Israel. But in the northern part of Israel, there are mountains. I had the privilege back in 2004 to 
uh, go with a group to Israel, and it was just amazing. You're in the southern part of Judah, way down there by Gaza, where the war is going on right now. And boy, it's barren, and it's desert, and it's ugly, and it's just, it's rough. But as you go further to the north in Israel, you end up going into the hill country and then up to where they have some mountains, and it's amazing the difference. You go up there, and it's green and lush, and there are streams, and there are fountains of water, and it's just beautiful up in that northern, in the mountainous part. That's Lebanon. And the Bible is saying here that the desert will blossom abundantly, and it will have the glory of Lebanon. God's going to change the desert to look like that beautiful mountainous area. And then it says the excellency of Carmel. Well, Carmel also is a mountain. It's a small mountain, but it is a mountain more towards the central part of Israel. You remember that from uh, Elijah, right? And where he had the showdown with the prophets of Baal, that's Carmel. And again, it's a raised up place. It's a place that has some altitude and there's some greenery there. And Sharon also is like that. And that they would have, their excellency would be given to the desert and they would see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. If I could sum all of that together, I would say this, that God has a plan for the world that after he judges it, he's going to bless the wilderness. He's going to bless the wilderness so much that it will look like the beautiful uh, areas of Lebanon. It will resemble the mountains of Carmel and Sharon, and all together they will be blessed. That's God's plan. The earth will see the glory of the Lord. But let's move on now to verses 3 and 4. So what is the answer then? What is the next statement that God makes? Strengthen ye the weak hands, and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong. Fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even with a recompense. He will come and save you. So what is the answer then? What is God's message with that promise that God would bless the world and the wilderness and make it blossom with the rose? Well, God's message is that we should strengthen the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. In other words, with somebody who is downtrodden and discouraged, they hang their head and their, ha and their hands hang down. And their knees are weak with shaking and there's no strength in them because they are discouraged. Have you ever been there before? God wants them to be strengthened. And by the way, is that you tonight? Do you, do you look around at the world and the things that are going on in this world and uh, you're discouraged by it? Uh, can you look back on a time when your hands were strong in the work of the Lord and your hand was to the plow and you were giving it all you had because uh, of your zeal for the Lord, but because of discouragement and seeing the world fall to pieces and seemingly the gospel, the seed of the gospel is falling on hard ground, that because of that your, your hands have weakened and your knees are feeble and you don't serve like you used to, you don't uh, give out tracts like you used to or share the gospel or uh, clean the church or serve in this way or serve in that way anymore and you're just kind of getting by. Well, God's message to you is, listen, strengthen your hands. Strengthen those feeble knees. Get back up and serve the Lord again. Why? Because God has a plan in all of this. It won't always be this way. But as I look at verse 3, it reminds me of another verse. Hopefully, as you read that verse as well, there's another verse or at least a truth from God's Word that comes in your mind. Turn with me to <clears throat> Hebrews chapter number 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Look at verse 5. Hebrews 12 and verse 5. <clears throat> and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. By the way, may I say, as I've said to some of you in the past, that when that says there, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, that does not mean that uh, God is always beating us with the rod. Chastening just means he's exercising us. He's getting us, uh, uh, putting us through hard times to make us stronger. Now, it does say then he scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Scourging is that beating with the rod. God spanks his children. 
Verse 7, if ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. In other words, you don't really belong to him. <clears throat> Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Let's stop there for a second. We're going to read verse 12. But did you notice what verse 11 says? No chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Anybody here like spankings? Not me. I remember them well. I didn't like them. However, they were a blessing. That's what it says there. Nevertheless, afterward, it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness. What's the result of God's chastening? Righteousness in our life, which brings peace unto them which are exercised thereby. What is God's plan for chastening? Is it that God is so angry with you that you haven't followed his way, and so he's going to put you through a hard time or maybe bring out the paddle, and he's going to spank you and say, boy, I feel better now. Now that their backside is bruised, boy, I just feel better. That's not what God is doing with all of this. What is God doing? He's bringing us through cha chastening and chastisement because he wants us to enjoy peace. And the only way we can have peace is through righteousness. And he's trying to bring about holiness in our lives and that which is right because he knows that we're happiest when we're doing right. Just like parents, you know your children are happiest when they're doing right. By the way, so make them do right. Don't be afraid to apply the discipline that is required to make them do right. Are they not doing right? Well, that's your responsibility to make them do right. And if you will put yourself to it, and if you will determine with God's help that you're going to make them do right, and I'm speaking about young children now, all right? Not talking about your 30-year-old, but I'm talking about your 3, 4, or 5-year-old. Listen, then apply yourself to it because here's what will happen. You watch. They'll be happier. You know who the miserable kids are? Those whose parents don't have any lines. Those who parent, whose parents won't apply the lines. And their kids are whiny and cranky and angry and frustrated. And you know what you and I would be if God didn't apply the rules and apply the discipline? We'd be angry and frustrated. And when we walk outside of God's truth, you know what we are? Miserable, angry, frustrated. But when God chastens us and disciplines us and brings us under his correction and we get through it, you know what the end result is? Man, it feels good to live for the Lord. You know what I came in, came in tonight to church? And listen, I was standing in the hallway talking to somebody and I was just overcome with a feeling of, Man, it's good to be in God's house. So good to be with God's people. I don't always want to come. I don't know about you. Is that a secret, by the way? The pastor doesn't always want to come. You know, sometimes I want to stay home. I'm tired. Uh, sometimes there's, you know, something else I'd rather do. And it's not always something that the flesh wants to do and come. Uh, I'd be here. But you know what? When I do, I think to myself, this is exactly where I need to be. It's so much fun to live for the Lord and be God's people. Well, that's a result of God working in our lives, isn't it? And there's joy and peace in that. That's God's goal. So look at verse number 12 now. Still in Hebrews 12, verse 12. Wherefore? Because of that. Because the result of God's discipline is peace by righteousness. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Let's go back now to Isaiah why does Hebrews use that very phrase almost exactly like comes from Isaiah 35? Why does the writer of Hebrews use that in reference to discipline? Because that's what Isaiah 35 is about. That God brought all of this judgment upon the world to discipline, to chast chastise, to chasten the world. And so here's what God wants to do now. Listen, now that all of that is done, Edom is a wilderness and all of that, 
Now listen, because that it's all done, lift up the feeble knees and the weak hands and strengthen them. And that's why it says in verse 3, strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees because the discipline is done and now you get to enjoy the blessing. Say ye to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. I remember when I was young and my dad would discipline me. It used to be years ago, the foyer was the pastor's office. There was a hallway that led out to the main door, but beyond that hallway was the pastor's office. And I got spanked in there many a time. So those of you who are sitting out in the foyer, that place has memories for me. I get out there and my backside burns. A couple of ping pong paddles were broken over this backside in that very space right there. By the way, it was good for me. I needed every one of them. I needed a lot more than my dad gave me, that's for sure. But I remember my dad was good. By the time he got to me, I was the ninth. By the time he got to me, he was good at discipline. What I mean by that is this, is he would sit me down when it was all done and tears were flowing and I could barely breathe, you know how that is with little kids. And he would sit me down and he would tell me, son, I love you. That's why I discipline you, because I love you. And son, it's over, it's done, no more discipline. You've been corrected. And he would take me in his arms and he would hug me and we'd embrace for a long time. And I would cry and I remember at least one time he cried with me. And he'd kiss me on the cheek and say, son, go play. I love you. Boy, that was a good feeling. It's amazing how after a spanking, when my backside still hurt, I felt good on the inside. You know that's what God does with you and me? That's the whole point of this. Listen, okay, the the discipline's done. And now I love you. So here's what he says. Say to them that are a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Listen, the end of all this is going to be a blessing. The end of all this wicked world, God is going to bring about a good thing in this world. Could it be that this is an indication that God is referring to the fact that you and I as his people ought to be encouraged in the midst of all of this? And the answer is yes. And we ought to, as it says here, fear not. Why? Because God is going to bring two things. Look with me at verse number four again. Say ye to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Why? Behold, your God will come with... Number one, vengeance. Even God with a, number two, recompense. He will come and save you. We should not fear because God's going to come with two things. After all the discipline, he's bringing two things with him. The first one is vengeance. That's why the Bible says, avenge not yourselves. Why? For he hath said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And when he comes, he's bringing a vengeance with him. And that ought to encourage our hearts. Be strong, fear not. I know the world's living wicked, aren't they? They are living horribly right now. But God's coming with a vengeance. That's a fearful thing, but it's also a good thing. There's a dichotomy in God's word a little bit, a little bit of a, a, little bit of a balance between two truths. That God is angry with the wicked every day, and yet God hates that the wicked dies in their sin. But God will. Psalm 58 puts it this way. You might write these verses down. Psalm 58, verses 9 through 11. And how does it end? That the righteous will bathe his feet in the blood of the wicked. Well, that's a little gory, isn't it? But it's God's word. And it says, I'm using my words now, basically, so that it will be said, verily, there is a reward for the righteous. Verily, he is a God that judgeth in the earth. And he is. He's coming with a vengeance. So don't fear. And that day is as sure as you and I are sitting here. The other thing that he will come with is a recompense. That means that not only will he avenge us, but he will reward us. That when he comes, he brings a blessing with him. That's why Galatians says that we ought to not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So continue to serve the Lord because he's coming with a recompense. Which brings us now to verses 5 and 6 that I would entitle, Sin's Curse Will Be Undone. We're all talking about when the Messiah comes. The earth will see the glory of the Lord. We ought to strengthen the weak hands. Verses 5 and 6, Sin's Curse Will Be Undone. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as in heart and the tongue of the dumb sing. 
For in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. What is that a reference to? Does a certain person's name come to your mind when you read those verses? The eyes of the blind being opened. The ears of the deaf being unstopped. The lame man leaping as a harp. Any individual, any certain very important person. The Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that exactly what he did? By the way, can you see now how Isaiah was written about 700 years before Christ even came. Can you see now how when Christ came and the miracles were being performed, why that was so important? You see now why God took the time to write it in the Gospels and record it? So that you and I can look and say, that was the Messiah. And the Jews should have seen, this is the one. Look, and isn't that what Jesus said when John the Baptist was in prison and he sent his messengers, his disciples to Jesus? Are you the one or should we look for another? And what did Jesus say? Look, the lame walk, you know, the, the blind receive their sight, etc., etc. And then he said, blessed are all they that are not offended in me. He was saying, listen, you see the miracles, remember the word, don't be offended in how I don't fit the paradigm that you thought. I don't fit in the box you thought the Messiah would fit in. But look, I fulfill it. And that's what this is all about, that when the Messiah would come, these things would happen. You might write these references down regarding the eyes. John 9, 1 through 7 is a miracle of Jesus healing the blind man. Mark 7, 31 is when Jesus unstopped the ears and by the way, also loosed the tongue of a man who was deaf and dumb. In Mark 2, verses 1 to 12, Jesus heals a lame man. He fulfilled each and every one of these right here. And what is all of that? It is sin's curse being undone. That's what the Messiah would do, which leads us to verses 7 through 9, <clears throat> that not only would sin's curse be undone, but a highway would be prepared by God. Verses 7 through 9, And the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water in the habitation of dragons, where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes. And an highway shall be there, <clears throat> and a way. And it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. Now, the reason that's important is this. When, because of Israel's sin both the northern ten tribes as well as the southern two tribes, they were taken captive. The northern ten tribes, tribes to Assyria. The southern two tribes went to Babylon. And they were taken in shame back to Assyria or Babylon. Many times they would be stripped down to practically nothing. They would be barefoot and they would be chained and they would be walked slowly back to the conquering country and they would be settled there, and it was a walk of shame. Again, the, the idea of stripping them of either everything or almost everything was to shame them, to embarrass them, to show them as they are conquered, and to walk them back to their country in shame. And so now God is talking about a time when they are going to return to Jerusalem, and what will that be like? Well, God's going to prepare a highway for them. A highway, we might think of, it, think of it this way as an interstate. The idea of it is a lifted up road. It's a road that's been built up, that's been leveled. Isn't that what they do most of the time with interstates, right? They, they might build a bridge over a low area so it's not going up and down. They make it more or less straight. They try not to have too many curves in an interstate. Hopefully very uh, lifted up and safe. That's the idea of a highway here, that God's going to bring them back and he's going to prepare a way for them. And it is a way of, or the way of, holiness. And what does it say? The unclean shall not pass over it. It's not for anybody who is not a true worshiper of God. Not for anyone who is not saved. And then notice what it says at the end of verse 8. I love this part. But it shall be for those. Well, who are the those? Well, it's, it's the, the holy ones. It shall be for those, the wayfaring men. In other words, the, the, the ones who are passing through on this road, though fools shall not err therein. In other words, they may not be skillful. 
They're not great navigators. They're like some of you younger generation, you still, you could not go home if you didn't have your GPS. You need one to go to the bathroom. That's how dependent you are on that stupid phone. Right? Those of us who are of the previous generation, right, Brother Eric, we still know how to use a map. Amen. That's right. So, by the way, we're going to outlive you because we know how to use a map. Right? If the apocalypse, apocalypse comes, you're the first one's gone. Okay? But all joking aside, listen, these wayfaring men on this highway, they might be fools. They might have no skill, but they won't err on this highway. It's laid out plain and simple for them. God has prepared it, and they will go to Jerusalem. And by the way, isn't that what God has done with you and me? Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians 1 and verse 18. <clears throat> For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Well, that matches so well with that passage in Isaiah, doesn't it? That this highway that God has prepared, though they are fools, though the, earth, the world would look at them and say, you mean those simple people are going to be able to make it back to Jerusalem? Those are the people that are going to inherit the kingdom that God has prepared? And God will say, yes, and I'm going to make sure they don't err off of that highway. I'm going to walk with them. I'm going to keep them. I'm going to keep them on that highway. And that is exactly what God has done with you and me. We did not find this salvation because we are better than anybody else. We did not find this salvation because we are wiser than anybody else. We found the salvation because God in his grace and his mercy reached down and saved us out of the miry pit. And I don't know why. And again, it doesn't mean we're Calvinists and that we you know, say that God chooses some to go to hell. I reject that idea. I believe that Jesus died for all. And yet, my salvation is not due to my wisdom. It is God's working in my life. I'm one of those just like you who was born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. It was God's working in my life, and it is in yours. And that's why you and I need to, in the end of it all, say, to God be the glory. I don't know why he did it, but he did. I don't even know how he did it, but he did. And he's going to keep me on the straight and narrow. And that's the truth. Isaiah 35, let's go back there. We've seen that the earth will see the glory of the Lord. He will, or we should strengthen the weak hands. Sin's curse will be undone. God will prepare a highway. Verse number 10. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Again, another verse that probably brings a different verse to your mind, right? Am I right that it's Isaiah 55, 11, I believe is the one that we use for the scripture song? It's a great scripture song, by the way, but it was said first in Isaiah right here. That on that highway, the ransomed of the Lord will return. Those 
whom God has saved, and all Israel shall be saved. That's what the Bible says, that they will return to Jerusalem on that highway. And on their way, on the way to Zion, they'll come to Zion with songs. Can you picture that? They're on that highway, and they're singing the whole way. And everlasting joy is on their heads. They have a joy that will not go away. It's not like your family road trip, by the way. You know, you start out one minute and you're singing and having a good time, and the next you're like, kids, if you don't stop it, I'm gonna... No, 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 they're all the way. It's everlasting joy. They shall obtain joy and gladness. And by the way, isn't that what we have been longing for for all of human history? To obtain joy and gladness. But what else, notice what else it says. I love this part. And sorrow and sighing shall flee away. It doesn't just say that sorrow and sighing will be no more. It says sorrow and sighing will flee away. The idea of that being they'll run. They're running the other direction that when God comes, when he sets up his kingdom, when he builds that highway, when Jerusalem is there, that, that listen, sorrow and sighing are going to hightail it out of there. Because the master, the savior, the creator of this world has come and no more will he allow that to happen. It all began with Adam and Eve and their sin in the garden and the curse that fell. And you and I have suffered ever since then, haven't we? But there's coming a day when Jesus comes and sets up his kingdom, when the Messiah comes, that all of that will flee away. And by the way, the title of the message again is what could have been and what will be the nation of Israel could have had it if they would have received their Messiah. Now, you and I understand that God knew from the very beginning it wouldn't be that way, but the offer was still there. And here's the beautiful thing. You and I might look at that and say, man, what they missed out on. But in the next breath, you and I ought to say, but boy, am I glad they missed out on it. And the reason that we say that is this, because the setting aside of them was our salvation. You see, God, when the Jews rejected the Messiah, God set them to the side as a nation, as a group, as a whole. And he turned his attention to the Gentiles. It's not that Jews don't get saved, they do. Paul was a great example of that. But God has turned his eyes on the Gentiles and he's calling from all nations, which by the way was always his plan. Calling from all nations a bride unto himself. That's a blessed thing. But there's coming a time when God will turn his attention back to the Jews and he'll save them and he'll prepare the way for them and all of that. And that's what we're reading here. That day will come. So what should the response of you and me be? Well, let's look back to verse number three. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Let's get back to serving the Lord. Don't be discouraged. Now listen, have you noticed that we're coming up on an election in November? Anybody here realize that, or did you forget? Did you forget for the 30 seconds they let you forget? Listen, but we don't know what that's going to turn out like. And it could be a mess. Would not surprise me a bit. But no matter what the result is, you have a job to do. Don't lose sight. Don't get sidetracked with earthly things. No man that warreth and tangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And you have been chosen to be a soldier. You have a job to do. Don't get caught up with the politics of this world. Certainly vote. Certainly get involved. Do the best that you can. Call your congressman or congresswoman if they'll leave an answer or care what you say, which I'm not convinced that they do. But listen, in the end, you've got a job to do. Stay focused on the task at hand. And if it goes bad in November, strengthen your hands, strengthen the feeble knees, and pick up the next day and get back to work for the Lord. And then notice verse four, say ye to them that are of a fearful heart, maybe that's you tonight, here's what God would say to, to us, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God with a recompense, he will come and save you. That is as sure as anything you'll hear for the rest of the week. God will come. And when he comes, he'll bring vengeance and a recompense. So let's get to work. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for these reminders that we have had now through this 
passage of Scripture and, and the Lord, this brief chapter in Isaiah. Thank you that you have opened the door of salvation to the Gentiles. Thank you, dear Lord, as well, that you have promised a coming kingdom when all of these things will come to pass, that sorrow and sighing will flee away, that joy and gladness will be the, the, the hallmark of your city. Lord, we long for that day. We ask that you'd help us to be faithful. Lord, would you strengthen our weak hands, our feeble knees? And would you help us to fear not and be glad because we have faith in your promise. Lord, would you help me and help these your people, I pray. Now, Lord, would you bless now in the time of invitation in Jesus' name, amen.